What is up, everybody? It is your boy Lou Martinez here live and direct from Chula Vista, San Diego, California, the Burrito Lounge, San Diego Latino Film Festival 2021 Hybrid Edition. Long road, one last stop along the way. Um, just wanted to quickly thank every single one of you guys that has stopped by the Q&As during this festival, every single person that has watched my films that have been part of this festival. And especially to the people behind the scenes, Ethan, Moises, Juan, and other people, Christian behind the scenes, setting stuff up. Um, all the people that make this festival possible. Uh, last night was a drive-in for the closing event. Um, Buena Vista Social Club uh, was the film that was played. They had a salsa band. So very appropriate that we close this festival, and I close this festival with a QA and a uh, about a movie that is about, the, uh, about salsa about uh, the music of the Latinx culture, uh, about places that I'm familiar with, Puerto Rico, Colombia, New York. Um, so uh, once I got a chance to watch the, this movie uh, that we're gonna talk to you about, um, I, was, I, was, I was impressed uh, by the scope of it, by the pace of it. So we wanna bring on uh, the director now, Sam, live and direct from the future. <laughs> How you doing, Luis? How you doing? How you doing, man? This, uh, uh, we've, we've done interviews with people in Germany, uh, all over South America, Central America, Canada, uh, Europe, but this is the first time that we're talking, uh, that I've done somebody with somebody. You're in Sydney right now, right? Right, yeah, I'm in Sydney. Um, Miguelito, uh, what, obviously, I, I mean, I, I did a little research, and I, and I know you've been touring with this, so-called touring with this film for a while, so I'm going to try to avoid uh, the questions that you might have been asked a bunch of times, but we really have do have to start um, at the at the genesis of this. How do you and Sydney, because um, I've talked to tons of directors, documentarians, and they, don't, they say that, um, you know, they don't necessarily sit around and be like, what am I going to make a movie about it? Usually the topic finds them. Um, so when did the, the, the bolt of lightning hit you, uh, that you dedicated so much time of your life, um, into, into this film? Well, uh, you know, I, I fell in love with salsa and, um, ended up traveling long story short, traveling to Colombia, uh, went to Cali and, um, met, you know, in Cali they they have this, uh, love for salsa, which is, um, Absolutely. you know, incredible. And, um, I was uh, digging for records. I'm a record collector, and uh, I just came across Miguelito's album, and it just struck me as being so different to anything, any other sort of 
uh, salsa record I'd seen. I never seen a young kid um, like was singing. It the, was it the cover or did you hear it? Yeah, well, it was firstly the cover. So I was digging through these records. I saw this cover. I was like, what is this? This is so interesting. And then a few of my mates told me the story of, of Miguelito, who he was. And I, I looked at the liner notes and saw all the credits. And then I heard it and um, I heard the track Payaso. And I just thought, man, this is this is a this is a story. This is a real story here. Before you knew anything else? No, well, I'd heard the story. Like I okay, heard, okay. when I was showing. So there's a big tradition in Cali about you know um, about uh, you know telling stories about records, all the stories behind each uh, each album. And uh, so you know they did like a bit of a, like a presentation to me, I guess, and was like, yeah, this is what it's about. He made this great record. You know, it disappeared when he was 11, and, uh, and that was it. Now, the disappearance and sort of the mystery of what happened to Miguelito is obviously what drives the story forward. But, you know, in essence, you know, it's it's similar to like some of the threads of some of like the, the documentaries that are popular today where, you know, they take this this path and then they tell you, oh, but by the way, <laughs> it really that it wasn't, you know, like like the sort of uh, documentary MacGuffin, so to speak. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. But your but your film is filled with instead of just basically like sidewinding, it's filled with a lot more parts of the story, the family angle, Harvey's angle, the band, the documentarians, the period. Um, did 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 those all appear to you when you started, or or did um did the the the, did the film grow in your mind the more you did research? Yeah, well, that's a really good question because at, at first I I. I, I didn't think I could find the family. I didn't think it was even possible. And I thought, you know, the, like, like the myth um, that I first heard that was the truth. And so initially I thought it was going to be a film a bit like Buena Vista, you know, a bit of like um, vignettes of these musicians because I was so interested around that world and that time. And I wanted the film to be about the album and not so much the mystery. Uh, and I think what the story did for me and what the album did for me is it opened up that world, you know, to tell, you know, to, to meet Papa Luca and Sonora Ponsenia and, and all the, all the music aspect of things. And so really what happened was as, as I was filming, um, it just sort of stuff just totally turned around and, and, and I was discovering new things and it became a whole new story. Uh, so yeah, it, it, it did really change a lot as I was filming and from what I'd set out to do. Yeah. Yeah, because it was I because one of the things that I love about about watching movies during the festival is I get to press play and not know a thing about the movie. Mm -hmm. You know, I just get to like yeah. completely be a blank slate. So as the movie starts, I'm 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 first thinking, okay, this is going to be a series of interviews with people and how they were affected by this record and how this record kind of you know was like this peak in salsa and blah 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 and then and, and then you just you get deeper into the harvey character and 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 him and then at first the family doesn't want to meet you and then you know it's it's this whole thing which is like a documentary about the documentary almost right yeah. uh and um man i just it, it, the, the layer the layers were profound and, and as much as it covered things that i'm interested in so obviously i want to i want to give you credit for 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 an incredible movie no 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 wonder it's gotten so much attention and so much love uh leading up to this so i'm glad that you're sharing it with us here at the festival um when you begin the process and and i think you said you you said that this took like 6 years about 5 years yeah about 5 years did you think that you were committing the next five years of your life to it? Or did you think that you were like in and out six months, I'll get some interviews, I'll put it together? Yeah. Um, Cause at some point it's got to like overtake you. Like, man, I spent two years on this and it's still yeah, going. Right. Totally. Totally. Well, I think it got to a point like that where I was like, I think I, I went, it was about three or three trips that I did to New York, Puerto Rico and Colombia. And I think, after the second one, I knew there was no turning back. You know, like I'd invested so much time. I think that was about the three year stage. I think, you know, it was. It sort of, you know, it was a, I guess, a blessing, but also a burden. You know, being so far away from it. You know, I had to use my time quite efficiently, and it sort of de defined a lot of decisions I had to make. But yeah, I think it was about the first time I went. I thought this is not going to happen, and then I don't know. It just I just kept listening to the record. I kept getting more into salsa, more into the culture. And I was like, I got to do this. And by that point, you know, I was just like, no, nah, I, I got to finish it. I got to make it happen. And that was it really. Are you, are you 
what well, are you saying three years? Are you, do you wake up in the morning and have your coffee and you're like, all right, it's time to work on a documentary or were you, <laughs> were you working a job during that time? Were you doing this full time, part time? How, how did that go? Yeah. So I, um, yeah, I was, it was pretty, pretty full time. I mean, like, uh, I had other jobs, you know, like, um, working on other, well, other films sporadically, but pretty much it was, it was mainly me. Uh, I had an editor on board for a, for a few months who came on and off. Uh, but yeah, I just, um, you know, it's, there was a lot, a lot of shot. There was a big ratio from, you know, from the film, which is 94 minutes, I think, which shot maybe like a hundred hours, something like that, you know, so wow. bring it down. And then I just really wanted to know all the material, you know, um, I'm quite, you know, specific about that so it just took a long time you know to really feel like i was on top of everything and and the whole story and yeah so yeah pretty much it was a, a hundred hours of footage my goodness that's yeah <laughs> were you um were you were you bringing your crew with you were you hiring locals how are you dealing with the logistics of having to move from sydney to new york to cali to puerto yeah. rico so i was pretty much a one-man uh band uh along the way though by a stroke of luck i i uh i ran into a guy that i went to school with here in sydney in new york so he came along with me for a bit of the way and then as sort of as the time went along i ended up um making contact with some people in puerto rico by chance and they they became involved and uh, and the same thing happened in cali in fact the film started with me like with a good mate of mine we went to cali together but uh yeah i mean pretty much it's been a one man band no man, that's 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 incredible. Especially if you're getting a hundred, you just you just uh, see them merite there, just you know, crap, just turning the <laughs> camera and seeing what happens, right? Yeah, and especially with very little Spanish at the time. I mean, my Spanish is much better now, but yeah, it was tough. All right, so you're from us. You're from you're from Sydney, then, right? Originally, yeah, yeah, right. And 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 then the the question is, is there something like um like do you ever get gets get get any crap about maybe well why would you somebody from australia be the right person to tell this story it hadn't been told before nobody had tackled it but yeah. but 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 what made you confident that kind of, you know i don't want to say being an outsider because if you're appreciating the culture and you're appreciating the music and you're immersing yourself in it and you're being reasonable with it I don't see any problem with that, but did at any point did, did you question yourself for that? Did you get any pushback for people from for that? Like, yeah, um, look, I think I think the people who observe observe a culture are the uh, are outsiders because you don't have that sort of um, those um, prejudice by sort of opinions and and the knowledge of 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 that of your own culture, and so I think I felt quite confident that I could observe stuff and ask questions that might have been, you know, obvious or blissfully ignorant. Um, and I felt okay with that. And I felt that, um, you know, yeah, there was, there was some moments, uh, when I would go into situations, sure, being an outsider. Um, but I think all the more people were more appreciative, you know, like for instance, when we went into, um, uh, Casarillos in 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 um, in Puerto Rico, where um, Miguelito um, grew up, you know Manuela Perez, and I was feeling a little anxious about it. But man, the guys there were so appreciative of, oh, you come from the other side of the world, you're telling us this stuff about our culture that we don't know of, and it was a really you know like beautiful connecting moment that we could connect through music and through stories. Uh, so yeah, I I think being an outsider has its has its pros and cons but in the end of the day uh it's something that really motivates me and i'm really you know appreciative and and loving about um about about your culture and it, it really gives me a lot of inspiration to tell stories you know uh i think being in australia uh you know uh it's something that maybe you know i don't we don't get a lot of you know like and and, and it's lacking and so every time i go back to that part of the world i just feel so inspired and you know it just make make stories forever you know there's got to be at least one good salsa club in sydney though right at least uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I wonder who's watching right now. But I mean, we've got one amazing band. We've got one great band, Marlo Marlo, who are fantastic. Big shout out okay. to Tammy. But uh, look, we've got a couple of clubs, but honestly, they pretty much play the same salsa all the time. And yeah. now it's becoming like more bachata. More merengue, and it's just like, oh man! You got you got all that vinyl, man. You get a couple of turntables, you can start playing some salsa sets too, right? Well, I mean, I've, I've bought so many records in Cali and everywhere. You know, mm -hmm. I'd love to do it, but uh, you know, it's a it's a bit of an uphill battle in Sydney <laughs> sometimes, to be perfectly <laughs> honest. But uh, yeah, look, hopefully, hopefully, we'll get some more. Yeah, me voy pa Cali. Um, the uh, well, I think you know what. Honestly, I think it falls. Uh, I think there's a difference between cultural appropriation and cultural appreciation Absolutely. and i think and i think that that um that that sometimes i did a q a for a documentary that was about north east mexico south texas indigenous cuisine and the culture and they brought a, a director and a cinematographer from uruguay um because they wanted somebody with fresh eyes on it so i think that also gives you like you said the ability to ask ignorant questions i do a segment on my own podcast called ignorant questions which is just you know things you don't know not to ask and i think they become great conversation starters and then this and in this case made for a great documentary now you don't typically well i mean it depends on the type of different documentary but you know there's you know i don't i don't really know if there's a concept of a bad guy in a documentary, all those, uh, maybe like the bear from Grizzly Bear or, you know, Grizzly oh, Man yeah. or something like that, or maybe, you know, but, yeah, but for, for lack of a better character, the Harvey character come, you know, well, the character, the person hmm. yeah, yeah, um, yeah. who's, you know, iconic in his own right, you know, sort of plays the role of this sort of bad guy in the movie. Now you had a decision to make in terms of giving people information during the movie in terms of like, you know, what you wanted to share with them at that point, do you almost turn from like a, a, a documentarian into like a scientist? Cause it's like for scientific purposes, I'm going to remove myself from this part of the equation. Right. Can you talk a little bit about that? Look, I was um, very adamant with both sides, you know, the family and Harvey that I wasn't going to give any favors to either, either of them, you know, like, I'm like, just like completely neutral, just observing. This is like, I, I, I found it really interesting, you know, like that, you know, these guys hadn't seen each other for so long and their relationship had been so damaged. And I was sort of this buffer in between them. And I was just thinking like, honestly, I was like, why do you want to talk, like go through me about it? Like, wouldn't you just want to go directly and like find out the real sort of thing? But, you know, I, I, I made it quite clear to both of them, like that both, there were both times during the film that they asked me that, you know, um, about information and, uh, and, and I was quite adamant that, you know, you, you can't just go through me, you know, I'm, I'm just here to tell the story about you guys and, you know, you want to find it all out, we're going to talk about it together, but not directly, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to give anyone any extra tips. And it's really, uh, you know, Harvey in my relationship, he's sort of just, uh, he's not very happy about the film. Um, okay. And, uh, you know, I've, I've, you know, felt pretty upset about that um, because I considered him a really good mate. And, and uh, I, look, I understand it's really difficult, uh, you know, how, how um, you know, you, you, uh, you, um, you deal with seeing yourself on camera and how you're being portrayed. And I think I, I, did a really, you know, I was trying to be really balanced as possible, you know, um, to try and give him every chance. And I, I think, I don't think he looks as bad as, as, as what he thinks, you know, I think it's understandable where he's coming from and it's, it's just really complicated. You know, it's a really, no one comes off, I guess in the end, really guilt free. I mean, sure. He could have done so-and-so, but at the same time he was trying to make a record. And I think, in the end of the day, I think you'll realize that I, I wasn't trying to make him look bad. I was trying to, and I never, never am. I always want to see the good in every, all of my subjects. I think it's just, yeah, it's really complicated. Like, like. Yeah, I, I, I guess that it, it probably like, if he has some, probably some time with it, he, he'll probably soften up at it. I think the initial, the initial reaction to seeing yourself like that and probably getting some negative feedback from the interwebs and stuff like that on how you're, how you're portrayed. Well, not portrayed, how you come off. 
yeah. uh, it's, it's probably going to be something. And, you know, even if it's a, a, vo- a minority, it's probably a vocal minority that might be, you know, getting in his ear or that he might be seen in his mentions or stuff like that. That might be like, it's understandable. But but I think that if he if he if he given time with it, hopefully he uh, he'll soften up because it sucks to, to ruin a, a friendship or relationship over a piece yeah. of art. That definitely puts you in a tough position as the as the filmmaker as to you know f- how how clean you feel about about putting something out, knowing that 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 maybe the family might feel that they don't come off looking very good, or he doesn't think they they, they come off looking good. Very good. How did the how did the family feel after the film came out? Oh, they love it. They love it. Um, we're really close. Um, we did a big screening in uh, his uh, barrio, um, and. Uh, it was like just wonderful. They're so proud of it. Um, you know, we're all really tight and uh, it's like just having another extended part of my family now in, uh, in Puerto Rico. So they're really, really happy. At what point during the process did you become aware of the finality of his story? Well, it was really when we were filming it, you know, like it was, like it was, it was, I, <laughs> Spoken in in a conversation with one of the sisters during um, when I was in New York, and I when they were I super apprehensive there, so that was like you didn't know what which way it was going to go because they just did not. I, I knew that there was obviously something. I mean, I knew I, I got the feeling like he was dead. You know, like I got the feeling like I mean, I can't make contact with him directly. He's, he's not with us. Mm-hmm. But actually, what happened to him? It wasn't. It actually really wasn't until after the film that I found out how it all happened um, exactly, um, like the specifics. But, yeah, when we were filming, you know, when we were filming that scene um, with his sister Evelyn, that was really when I found out, yeah. Now, was the was the car accident propaganda so people would leave them alone? Because maybe, or 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 was that just uh, misinformation? Was that just that just something that that got created, you know, in the conversation about what happened that somebody said that stuck? Yeah, well, I think it was it's just like an urban myth that it started uh, originated in Cali. I, I'm pretty sure, uh, and I think a lot of the guys there who love the record were just like, "Why didn't he make another record?" And I think somehow got started well he didn't make a record because he was run over you know like or the car accident thing um was that new miguelito coming out no nope. oh, nah. he, he got run over by a car oh what yeah 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 i don't know it was just like it was i mean when i was researching uh the film initially it was that was it it was just like everything i'd read was like yeah he would be run over by a car like it was like a common sort of story online and i was like oh, okay and then when i went to cali and i met all uh, Los Malomanos, uh, they all came and told me the same story. So when I presented the film, uh, they were like, wow, this is really a big thing. You know, like they were really surprised. And your your next film is going to be about those about those guys. Is, is, is that true that uh, you're going to spend a little time with them? Yeah. So uh, before lockdown, I, I went back to Cali and I shot a lot with uh, the record collectors there uh and build up to the feria so it's going to be a bit of a story about the um the audition parties there and uh how people in in cali just love salsa um there's a couple of ideas there's a one about these little kids who are record collectors like um about like about miguelito's age 11 or so and then there's a a a police uh station a radio station who are really like play the best salsa in all of cali so but there's a few angles. I mean, there's so many stories. I mean, I've been going through the rushes the last few months. And, um, you know, I thought I shot a lot on the last one. <laughs> but this one's, like, ridiculous. But um, it's great. It's great. There's <laughs> so much inspiration, you know, getting in touch with so many people who love music and love salsa. And, you know, it's just a, a joy. You know? That sounds like the um, Adam Sandler uh but the Adam Sandler making of Method movies where he's like, oh, we want to go with all my friends to South Africa. Let's shoot a movie there. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I want to go spend some time in Colombia. I guess I'll just go shoot a documentary down there. That sounds like fun. Like a good, that sounds like a, just a good excuse to go down to Colombia for a few months. Yeah. Can't wait to get back. I cannot wait to get back. Um, when you, um, when did you, when did you become, or when did you did you start off when you were younger, like obsessing about any specific movie, 
when uh, like either like a doc or a, nar- or a narrative film when you were growing up? What's the first movie that you're obsessed about that you kind of watched over and over? The first movie I'm obsessed about. Well, I mean, yeah. What would it be like? Or a couple. Yeah. Um, look, I love like, um, look, I mean, uh, Andre Rubilov, Stalker, you know, all the Tarkovsky classics I love. Okay. Um, Paris, Texas, you know, that was a really big influence on in my life. Um, big influences, like all the Andre Vida films, you know, like um, I love them. Uh but yeah, I mean, for this film, Buena Vista was a big influence, you know? Black okay. Orpheus. Um, uh, what else did I really like? Yeah. Chinatown. That's what oh, I was. Right. You know, there you go. You know, like, what an absolute machine of a film. I mean, I, I and, and Ryan, you know, a bunch of them. <laughs> you know? I think for this film, though, yeah, Buena Vista was a big influence. You know, it was a really big influence. Um, about stylistically how I was going to go about it, about even about the story, you know? Uh, and I think, yeah, I, I think with my style of uh, documentary, I always want to blur it with narrative, you know? I never really want it. Like you were saying a while ago about like the whole, oh, this is going to be like talking heads. I'm really not anti-talking heads, but I always feel like I want to keep that rhythm going, you know, with my style of filmmaking, you know? I never want it just to be static. And I think... Um, you know, also with the narrative, you know, like, um, you know, we could have gone like, oh, this could just be a mystery, like some sort of Netflix um, right. pop punk thing. But I felt like, you know, films, the, the films that I love have got those multi layers, you know, Chinatown, for instance, you know, like there are so many layers there that I still probably don't even understand. And, and I love that about a good story and about a good film. If I can watch it and like, feel like I don't really understand it, but I know it's amazing. Mm. You know, you know, you know, that's a good film. <clears throat> One of the things that I enjoy the most about being part of the festival, I, I'm a traditionally a narrative filmmaker. I make comedy, drama, stuff like that. And, and I'm trying to dip my feet into documentaries. I always had a, a large respect for for documentarians because you know one thing I heard early on in film school or something where it's like, okay, here's a, you know, the minute you start recording something, you've already changed its nature. It's already not acting the same. Like, and I was just like, Oh my God. Like, and then I, I, I grew up with these, you know, these movies like hoop dreams and, 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 the, oh, yeah, the, great film. Love that film. you know, um, some of my favorites, anything by Oppenheimer, the, the look of silence, the act of oh, killing yeah. grizzly man, uh, cartel land. And, I, I love, love, love documentaries. So getting t- to speak to people and talk about the process of it is, is my, my favorite part of being a part of the festival. Um, so I've learned so much about from you, uh, just from this interview and the other interviews that I've done with, with documentarians, just about the different processes and stuff like that. A hundred hours of footage and you edited this yourself or did you have help? Uh, I had a, a mate come on board for about 12 weeks, but yeah. Uh, apart from that, mainly it was me, you know, um, with, you know, my very little Spanish as well. So that was like a real like speed yeah. hump, you know, trying to get through a lot of like the, and very different dialects, you know, like Boricans and, and uh, Caleños speak very different, you know, like, um, so it was a struggle, but, you know, got to do it, you know. Yeah, one of one of my first early editing gigs was sitting behind an American editor who was editing a Spanish project and just... Oh them telling me this sounds like it's something interesting what are they saying you know <laughs> yeah exactly exactly oh man <laughs> totally i don't know you know you just sort of get get into it and you just um you know take it bit by bit and i think the editing process is like you know in documentary you're like a storyteller no like you you you're you're you're, 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 you're like a writer and i think um it's quite challenging when you're uh, making documentaries is finding good collaborators in post because I think uh, editors, for instance, love the idea about working in documentary but don't really understand the process and how much work it really takes. I think nowadays with certain productions, you can have, you know, like um, 
transcripts and, you know, like scripted sort of ideas about how the story's going to flow uh, or if it's like a talking heads thing, you know, where it's all scripted before. But, you know, with Obdoc, none of that really exists. You know, it's like this pure storytelling and you're really like collaborating with the writing process and figuring out how it flows, which is a real challenge. Yeah, because I mean, they say you either script it out, and then it's more, it's more similar to you know the narrative where you after you write it out, you have to go execute the shots and the information that you want, or you just shoot a bunch of stuff and then find it in the edit, which seems like a reasonable option until you realize you're scrubbing through a hundred hours worth of footage to find a story, and and your brain somehow has to put it together and be like, okay, maybe this would work with this, this would work with that, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, well, you know, man, it's uh, you're you're spending some time in my in my motherland in Colombia. So if you know, if you if you need some help on the back end on this one, just let me know, man. I got you. I <laughs> um, you've 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 um, I've seen. Uh, I did a couple. I did. I did. I watched the movie without knowing anything about it. But then leading up to this to to our Q and A, I did. I did try to look at a couple of uh, of of interviews and stuff that you did. Um, because you've been. You know, you've been in this. This doc has been in a lot of in a few in a few festivals. Um, how, how? What was your? Did you always think it was good? Did you? Did you get? Did you have like an imposter syndrome? Or when you started to get these these acceptances, you know, take us a little bit behind that process of how that how that made you feel. Did did you feel validated? Did you feel like yeah, I don't suck? What, what was that? What was the process for you? Look, I'm still dealing with it, honestly. Um, wondering about questions, about, you know, editorial questions, where it could have gone, how I could have improved it, how I could have shot it and, and so forth. Those questions I feel like will never end as much as I'd like them to. I still question about how I could have done a better job. Uh, I feel like, yeah, it's... it's um, I do feel like it's something and I feel I'm glad it's out there and that it's got an audience and people are seeing it. I'm really happy about that. And yeah, I do feel validated. Um, but yeah, it was a really tough process at the beginning, you know, like uh, I think a few of the early festivals we got, I mean, we got accepted into the first film, uh, the first uh, festival was at Cartagena and I was like, this is perfect. You know, this is so great where this nice. film belongs, but you know, like, you know, I think before that we tried for South by Southwest and didn't make it and even for the Sydney Film Festival here in Sydney and didn't get in and I was like really in a dark headspace about that whole thing, you know, <laughs> with like rejection. So, but, you know, like it's – and watching how other films had gone at the same time, you know, it, it's so um, – you know, the whole festival thing is so subjective and it's so dependent on so many other – factors and I'd, I'd watch some of these films you know of the success that my film didn't uh and and i was like what's going on you know like why this film is basic you know like <laughs> you know but um look at the end of the day i think what i realized is the people that know and care about cinema really love the film and i think that's what really um made me feel great about it you know like it's like you know, someone can watch, you know, so, and I think nowadays as well, you know, where so many people have such a short intention span or they just watch, you know, something on Netflix or they have, everyone has an idea about what documentary should be. And I think documentary has the possibility to be, you know, the one of the strongest, purest forms of storytelling uh, that I think a lot of people don't really understand. Uh, so, when I got it to that audience of real cinephiles and they had a real appreciation for it, I was like, yeah, I feel like I'm onto something here. And yeah, you know. yeah I think people have a tendency to, to equate documentaries with like Ken Burns, like, like an 18 hour, like, you know what I mean? Like a picture and a, and a letter from a civil war guy writing to his, we ran out of butter today, sweetheart, and you know the enemy's right over the hill. Like they, they, I think that that they docs get pigeonholed into that like a little bit on the surface. But one of the things that I've been learning is that there's six distinct types of documentaries, um, yeah. and and beyond that, 
you should be blending them and adding narrative and adding you know interesting things there's a doc that that screen here called 499 um which was incredible and in that it blended a ton, ton of different ton of different types of docs into one um yours is more is straightforward but i felt like like i said like at the beginning i felt like okay this is just going to be a bunch of like little things like buena vista like you know we're going to be talking then we're going to have somebody singing a song mm -hmm. then we're going to get starting a song um the 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 archive footage and the old pictures and the stuff like that. Um, yeah. Well, how do you know? Like, because I'm sure there was just throves of it. How do you decide? And is that usually where you make like your first cut in terms of time and stuff like that? Where you're like, well, I guess I can cut out this performance and I can cut this out. But how do you how do you decide the blend from the talking heads to the doc about the doc to the history to the music to the pictures? Yeah. How do you decide that blend? Look, I think it sort of just told itself about the, the decision process about how I was going to mix it all together and, and editorially when I was going to cut from those different moments. But I think the archive is such a big part of this film because I really wanted to, you know, there was no, apart from about, uh, you know, 10 photos of Miguelito and the one photo with him and Harvey, there was nothing I could find, you know, apart and, until I met his family and we found some of his uh, photos of that time, but the, uh, like when he was older than 11, but from that period, there was really very little of Miguelito. So the challenge was how am I going to portray the world of this kid without really ever seeing him? So it was a nice, like actually it was a nice box to have because it limited like okay. the amount of stuff I could use and, and, and what I could do. But, that was really the, the use of the archive was to bring that world that he was around and try and understand this kid is going to be around this world and all this stuff and trying to constantly throughout the film pay homage and respect to that time and be like, okay, so just a reminder, guys, this was that world. This is what this kid was going through at that time and this is where they are now, you know. So, you know, I think um, it's, 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 you know, it, you know, you look at those worlds and you think, you know, it was so much, it was so grand, you know, in that whole Fania era and, and 70s New York. And then you look at where those guys are now, you know, um, and it's definitely not sort of um, continued. That's Let's just put it that way. And, you know, trying to see how those guys stick together. You know, it's, it's, it's just a part of, of, of how I had to tell that story you know, and how to keep it, keep it interesting as well for the audience. You know, you could, you can make a case that if the, if the Miguelito story had happened uh, during a time of YouTube or social media, it could have been more like a Justin Bieber type story where somebody mm -hmm. that, that was, had talent when they were a kid, but they're, they're being documented. They're, they're finding a voice. They're, they're singing adult songs as a kid, mm -hmm. but they, you know, they're, they're, they're crafting the following, right? So M Miguelito was also a victim of his time in terms of, of having the talent, but not the, not the, not the exposure, I guess. Right. Mm -hmm. Listen, I think, I think Canto a Borinca and the, the album Look, I know what I love about it is like you can it's it's something that you can you have to use a bit of your imagination like you can I can hear in it that it, he was going to blow up. Like I can hear like with the backing and with the way that it was recorded and and all the musicianship it's like it's like almost there and it's ready to explode and he like the next album would have catapulted for me. Like mm -hmm. he was the same he grew up like I think a year or so before Lalo Rodriguez in the same barrio. So, you know, and Lalo went off to, you know, win a Grammy and, you know, have all the success that he had. Um, and I just often wonder, like, you know, if Miguelito had, you know, stuck with it for a bit longer, what could have happened? You know, there's so many questions, you know, so many question marks about that. And I think you're totally right. He was a victim of his time and, in a sense, it's a very classic, you know, um, showbiz New York story. He was just like one in a million and, and, you know, just one of the others and it didn't work out for him. And, you know, how many of those still exist, right? You know, there's like, you know, it's like it's like athletes, you know, like the, that fourth guy who just didn't qualify for the 100 metres in 
for the Jamaican, you know, sprint right. team. He went off to be a bobsledder, or or he just went off to went off the rails and did whatever. Um, you know, it's a story that's not uncommon, but doesn't mean it's not a great story and they're not a great performer or athlete or whatever. Um, we're looking live on the final day of the San Diego Latino International Film Festival 2021 edition with Sam uh, Zub uh, Zubricki. Is that correct? That's pretty good, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, of um, uh, Miguelito Canto Aborincuen. Um, a great doc about uh, uh, salsa, the island of Puerto Rico, the, uh, the culture, the business of making records. Um, and you can actually still watch that today as part of the San Diego Latino Film Festival. You can pause this Q&A, go watch the movie, come back and finish it up. Uh, you can order it today and you have 24 hours to watch the movie before eventually, probably I'm assuming that it's going to have a nice cushy landing spot somewhere after its festival run, hopefully. Um, but um, but do you feel like uh, do you feel like there's anything do you feel like there's anything people don't get about the documentary when they watch it uh, do you what's the most common question that that you get from people you know direct directed towards you the one question I often get asked is about is about Harvey and Nicolita's relationship and what went on between them during the recording process and I was very adamant uh, not to to leave that open ended, you know. Like um, it's not my it's not my. I I felt like it wasn't my um, right to sort of um, propose one side versus the other, and I wasn't there, you know. And it's a very delicate issue. And so whatever happened between them, they know the truth. Miguelito is no longer with us. Harvey has his version, um, you know, which, you know, I completely understand and the family can only speak for Miguelito. So that's often been a common question. I mean, it depends on the audience as well. A lot of the Western guys make a big deal about that. But in, you know, with, with Puerto Ricans or with Galenos, uh, or, or the or greater Latin American audience, it didn't seem like it was a, a bigger question. It was more about just the music and the album. Mm -hmm. But yeah, a lot of a lot of uh, and a lot of the the Western festivals were like, you know, what happened between them. And uh, for me, yeah, look, it's it's history. I have an opinion about it, but that doesn't mean I'm right. You know, like I think like that's often been the common conversation. And like, you know, how, how do I, how, something that happened 40 years ago that I wasn't a part of, you know, I trust, I trust, I want to see the best in both, you know? Yeah, it's almost like 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 it's a search for like the Loch Ness monster or or a Sasquatch, and uh, Canto Borinquen is like that look back to the camera, like the, the one thing where he's like, hey, we got a little glimpse of him in this album. All right, how many uh, how many total pieces of vinyl do you own currently as a record collector? Oh God, I have no idea. Oh, Maybe like in oh, the thousands, you know. Oh, I was about to say over a thousand, huh? Over, over. Oh yeah, like this is actually. Um, I've been doing a bit of moving around, so actually this whole wall is usually filled. So um, yeah, God, I don't know how many it is. It's it's a lot, and it's building all the time. After the last um, Colombian trip, it it grew quite extensively. I exponentially huh yeah yeah, yeah. That's, good. that's good um and then um how has how, how how has the last year in terms of like covid and also you guys were dealing with you know uh fires and everything all around there how how has the um how has the industry bounced back in that part of the world um and 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 do you ever see yourself doing something or focusing on some local topics or are you enthralled with like the world that you're not that familiar with and want to keep in that area <laughs> Look, I'd love to tell some more local stories uh, if I find the, the story that I really care about. You know, like I think the films I make, uh, you know, five years, it's a, it's a big investment. You want to you wanna do something that you really care about. You're not going to just make something that, you know, you're not really behind. So, look, I'd love to do something local, and I'm sure I will. I just need to find the right thing. Uh, right. The or industry, it, it needs to find you. So it needs to find me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I do feel like there are a couple of things that are sort of in the woodwork. I mean, well, okay. you know, in the works, which is happening.
but the industry itself uh, is doing a lot better now, I think, here. Like, as far as drama goes, uh, I mean, I, honestly, I don't think there's a lot of big... Oh, no, there's a few local productions, you know. They're doing... A, what are they doing? Um, the Elvis film up in up north, and then we're doing the new Thor thing, I think, as well. So there's, like, some big, actually, American productions that are happening, but local stuff, I don't know. But everyone's, look, uh, you know, locals are getting employed, so that's good for them, you know. All but, right. Yeah. COVID, who knows? Hey, who knows? Hey, it's a, it's a brand new world. Um, it's funny, like I said, uh, I heard Moises and Juan say this a couple of times, but the movie theaters um, were, they're almost about to open fully in San Diego. So they're just kind of, they were kind of questioning themselves, like maybe we should have waited for the festival a little bit. But I think that that for this year, it's appropriate. And obviously I'm appreciative of, of being able to expand it to a worldwide audience and, and people and having conversations with filmmakers that can't necessarily uh, hop on a plane to, to be in San Diego. Although I'm sure, you, I mean, not that San Diego has anything on the Sydney beaches, but uh, but I'm sure you probably would have had some fun out here as well. Oh yeah, what's the best what's the best salsa club in San Diego? <laughs> oh man, there's there's tons. There's a lot of there's there's uh they they have some some downtown clubs that uh, in uh, in the gas lamp district in San Diego that are pretty good. It depends on the night. That's when you know you're in a good salsa night salsa club when it's like, what's the best salsa club on a Thursday? Oh, you, know, you know what I mean? Oh. That's kind of, but, uh, but grow but, but I'm from Medellin and I'm from Colombia. My dad is from Uruguay. I grew up in Queens, New York, surrounded yeah. by salsa, merengue and stuff like that. So, so the music and all that stuff is ingrained in me since I was a kid. So, uh, for, for me, this Q and a was right at, right in my wheelhouse in terms of some, a movie that, that I was already predisposed to. And then I love talking to people that make documentaries. So again, Sam, I appreciate the fact that you showed it here at the festival and I appreciate that you came on with us to, to have a little conversation about your process along the way. Oh, pleasure. Pleasure, Lewis. I'm really glad that uh, the film could be a part of the festival and it was great to chat. Excellent. Excellent. And like I said, man, uh, I'm a Colombian editor in San Diego. I work remotely. <laughs> you need any, you, you need, you need something regarding that. You let me know, man. I'll, I'll do some translation for you or whatever you need. You just hit me up. Uh, a 2 a.m. burrito, right? That's it. Yeah. 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 Two, two, yeah. You just 2 a.m. burrito.com. Hey, okay. Let me ask you this. The reason my company is called 2 a.m. Burrito is because it's a San Diego thing. When you're out at us after you go to the salsa club or oh, yeah. after you go to the casino or whatever at two in the morning, you, you get a yeah. burrito and you go home. What is the Sydney equivalent? We get a we get a kebab or a, a kebab, you know. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's our thing. So yeah. If, yeah, so if I was in Sydney, it'd be 2 a.m. kebab. Okay, all right, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> all right well again man everybody you can go watch the movie right now just order it tonight you can have 24 to watch it uh sam uh from miguelin canto uh borinquen um a great great documentary about salsa about uh, about the industry it's really awesome man so i hope you and harvey make up and uh, i appreciate you guys i appreciate the film and i uh, wish you the best man so i'll be in touch uh hopefully we'll, we'll chat later on thanks Lewis. all the best bro all right, man. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Be sure to watch the movies. It's been awesome being part of the festival this year. Uh, and take it easy. Okay.